Okay. Great. Hi guys, sorry it took me a little while to get back. Um, I was scared that if I deleted this from the Instagram before the YouTube started uploading it, that uh, for some reason the YouTube wouldn't be able to do it anymore. And it probably doesn't matter, but I didn't want to take the risk and it just took a while. So, I'm back. We now have the spoon that is basically done. Uh, it just needs the bowl hollowed out. So this video is going to be about how I hollow out the bowl. Um, this is a weekend special. Weekend specials are when I try out something new and just carve one spoon on Saturday and one spoon on Sunday instead of filling orders the way I do the rest of the week. Um, and it's a chance for me to try out ideas, see if they work. Um, in this case, the idea I'm trying out is whether or not I like having bevels wrapped around the, the back of the bowl. Um, and uh, so that's what I am doing. I kept the top of the, uh, sorry, the back of the handle. I kept the top of the handle nice and flat. I rounded bevels all along the back of the handle. Um, and so far, I really, really like it. You know, it gives you a, a flat space for your thumb to be on, but then it, it just uh, cushions the fingers underneath a lot. I'll probably be doing it more um, on my regular work which is exactly the point of a weekend special. Um, okay, so now I'm done with the Sloyd knife and I'm gonna use a hook knife. So, let's see. All right. I'm trying to do it so that you guys can see what I'm doing here. Basically, I always carve the same way with a hook knife. I've gone through this before. I choke up on the blade it's helpful that this blade has a nice rounded spine, keeps my uh, hand comfortable. And, um, and all I'm doing is I'm supporting the bowl in the palm of my hand. And I just start in the middle and work my way in a little line down the middle. It's over to one side. Um, but you'll notice that I'm staying away from the edges. And I go back and I line it out more. Now, this isn't cutting my thumb because basically when I close up my hand, all I'm doing is opening and closing my hand. And when I close up my hand, as long as I keep my thumb straight, um, it can't actually hit my thumb. Uh, it is possible, and you can see on my, my thumb, it is possible to occasionally touch, in which case you'll cut a, basically a straight line in your thumb. But in this case, it didn't even go deep enough to bleed. Um, because this handle just chokes up in my hand at a certain point. I'm, I don't ever try and go up and over my thumb like this, like you see some people try and do, uh, for two reasons. One is I find that that's really stressful on these muscles in my hand. And the second is that if I ever did misjudge it, I would slice off a chunk of my finger and, or a big flap instead of just cutting a little line in my thumb. So for me, it's all about this, basically that. Um, and so that's one cut. That's the cut that does this. And then as I go further along, you'll see I'm doing these sort of sweeping cuts and that motion, I'm basically holding the knife still, keeping my thumb out of the way and then pulling it around and around. Um, so those are more finishing style cuts. Whereas this is the, the roughing out cuts where you're hogging out material and I'm using a fair amount of force. Until you're comfortable with sort of what your knife can do, I would say start off slow, take little nibbles, and as you get more comfortable with what your knife can do, see whether you can get larger pieces off. So the way the grain is tilted in the bowl, it just makes sense for me to come down the bowl like this, and then turn it around, put it against my sternum, support it here, keep my hand out of the way, but again, I'm bracing with the back of my thumb here, and then do similar sort of hogging out cuts where I'm opening and closing my hand, this hand, um, here to get this middle of the bowl. But again, you'll see it's about removing the, the bulk of the weight of material in the center of the bowl, and then I'm staying away from the edges. And once I've successfully done that, and I've basically 
hollowed this out. Um, just want to make sure that wasn't. Nope. Okay. Want to make sure that wasn't my kids coming home from the play date. Um, so once I've successfully done that, now I can start deepening as I'm also pushing my way out to that rim, and the rim is getting smaller and smaller. So um, now that I have this like this, I'm basically working my way around in a circle so that no one area gets more thin and delicate ahead of the rest of the, the areas. So guys, I'm reading this really interesting book that I want to tell you about. It's uh, just got at the library yesterday. It's called Dollars and Cents. Oh, it's, is it backwards? It's backwards. Dollars and Cents, How We Misthink Money and How to Spend Smarter. And it's written by these two authors who are both uh, economists, but they're also uh, comedians. Um, and so it's entertaining to read, but it's also, uh, there was this really interesting bit that I read this morning that was talking about how, it was talking about pricing and how people's sense of fairness in pricing will influence how much they are willing to pay, how much indeed they're happy to pay and whether they're happy paying a price or not. Um, and, uh, and I don't know, it's gotten me thinking a lot about, about pricing and, and how I approach pricing. I'll, I'll probably write a blog post about it soon, but I just wanted to share some of my thoughts, which are that, um, you know, they, they point out, it seems like there's, uh, you could either do the, the sort of disingenuous thing of making something look harder than it actually is, um, thereby making it appear more valuable to people, um, which would be, uh, the example they give is a locksmith who is able to open your door quite easily, but charges you a fair amount of money because it took them a great deal of skill to be able to do it that easily. Um, and what they, <laughs> what the locksmith they interviewed said was, yeah, I used to charge people a lot more and I would actually, or I, it's not that he would charge them a lot more, it's that he would make it look hard. Sometimes he'd break the lock on purpose and then he'd replace the lock. They, people would end up paying him a lot more in the end, but they would tip him. They would be awfully happy. They would think that he'd done this thing that was really hard. And that when he started being just honest with people and taking two minutes to open their locks, that people were disgruntled at how much he was charging them, even though in the end they were paying less than they were when he was being dishonest with them. Um, and so there's this way in which uh, we want to, we, we value something that appears to take a lot of effort. Um, and yet what we don't value is effort that has gone into something that we that we don't see right we want our music for free online because we think of its creation as something that has happened in the past whereas uh when we go to a restaurant and we're paying for something that is happening right in front of us in terms of the service that we're getting we're happy to pay more for it or, or pay for it at all because we're perceiving it as value that we're getting in the moment so what these authors described um was, so you can see now I'm I'm ghosting my way up to the rim and I'm also building my way down, just going around and around in circles. And in a little bit, we're not quite there yet, but in a little bit I'll start trying to make my cuts, finishing cuts, no matter what cut I'm making, I'm, try, I'm going to try and exit it cleanly enough that I can leave it if I need to leave it. Anyway, back to fairness and pricing. What these authors suggested was that the, the way around this so that you could charge a rate that was reflective of the effort that has gone into your thing over the course of time it took you to charge for it, uh, to, to develop that skill, was transparency. Was transparency around the effort that went into it. Not just the effort that it took you to develop that skill in the first place, but the effort that people might not have seen in the process. Um, and I think that this is where the internet is wonderful, that uh, you can see how much effort it is taking someone 
to do something. Um, now that doesn't necessarily mean that it should result in a higher price per se, because I don't think that price should really be linked to the amount of time it took you to make something. But I do think that it's a useful tool that will help people feel good about buying something from you at a certain price if you um, share your process with them. The more you share your process with them, the more it becomes clear to them what goes into making this thing. Um, <laughs> which in a very meta way is exactly what I'm doing here. Um, and it's not to convince you to, to pay a, a high price, but it's just a, it's just part of being transparent about a, a process as a way of getting people psychologically on board to want to support you in a way that they would otherwise not be if you hadn't been so transparent, which I think is fascinating. And I think it's like exactly what I have intuitively felt all along that the more I share, the more people want to be a part of what I'm doing rather than the more I share the, I've never believed that I should hold off from sharing something with the idea that then people, if, if I gave it away for free, then people wouldn't want to pay me for it later, I, I feel like I've always experienced the opposite to be true, that the more I share, the more people want to work for me, the more people want to take lessons with me because uh, they either see all the nuance that could be there um, or they just want to be a part of what I'm doing. Um, and, and yeah, so that's been really interesting to read this chapter and sort of realize that uh, what I felt all along was is actually backed up by the research um, of how people psychologically respond to um, not just pricing scenarios, but uh, sort of being involved in the process of a thing. Okay, so now I'm doing finishing cuts up here. I've got the rim about the way I want it, and but the depth isn't quite there, and I can feel that just by going like this. Over time, you'll be able to feel the thickness of something and get a sense for how thick you want it to be. Um, now the other thing to consider is, is the taper. Do you want it thicker in the middle and thinner at the edge or thinner in the middle and thicker at the edge? If you are new to carving and you are doing a fairly robust rim, which I would recommend if you are, if you're just starting out to make, give your rim a little more thickness than what I have here, maybe not quite as twice as thick, but, um, then it might make sense to do a bowl that was thinner in the middle because it has that thick rim. Um, as you get more experienced and your rims naturally get thinner because a thin rim pulls out of your mouth much more easily. Good, puppy's still asleep. Um, as that rim gets thinner, you will naturally want to leave a little more weight in the center of your bowl and that will help keep the whole thing stiff. If you keep this thin, as you make this thinner, then the whole thing gets too flexible. Um, so exactly how much is something that you just need to figure out from experience or from buying spoons from somebody who does it that way. Um, this particular technique is something I learned from Dan Lawrence in the UK. I bought a spoon from him and I thought, you know, what is it about this that is and I realized that he was doing the opposite of what I was doing. At that time, I was doing thick rims and a thinner center because I'd seen a diagram, I don't know, maybe maybe on Robin's blog about how that's how he was, how he was approaching things. Um, and so then that's how I was doing things. Then I got this spoon from Dan and I was like, man, why, why is this? so good. And when I started really analyzing it, what I realized is that he was doing very thin rims and then he was leaving more weight in the middle of the bowl. And so that just means that when you pull the spoon out of your mouth, the whole thing just whoop, comes out of your mouth like that. Um, and it's really delightful. Um, so as I'm trying to do these finishing cuts, I also want to make sure right here in the, the in the bowl, 
is often undercut, um, meaning that it's too flat. And that partly because to get this cut clean, you got to do a pull cut down like this, and um, and that can be can feel kind of awkward. Um, but that's an area where if it's not, if it doesn't have a nice concavity to it, you will feel it in your mouth right away. It'll feel like the, like it's pushing up on your upper lip in a way that isn't particularly nice. So, and you can see that I'm ghosting out to this rim. And I'm not trying to match it to the outside edge because it's easier to get a nice curve with the hook knife than it is with the sloyd knife on the outside. So, in fact, I'll go back and I'll ease these little bumps. Yeah, there we go. I'll ease these little bumps on uh, the outside edge once I've got the inside exactly the way I want. So, um, so I'm using that outside edge as sort of a, a guide, but I'm not trying to match it perfectly. Okay. Now the other thing I found, I used to, I, for a while I was doing rimless spoons where I would actually make it that there was no top rim that you could see, that there was a side rim, but that all you would see from the top was the perfect silhouette. And what I found was that while those felt really good in your mouth, I didn't like how they photographed. There was a way in which you needed that little tiny rim, even a tiny rim, to define the shape. And that when there was no rim, it was it was almost unsettling to look at the spoons. They looked like they were missing something. Um, and as soon as I added what I call a micro rim back to it, that they they weren't unsettling anymore. They, 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 were, they started to pop in photographs again. So because a lot of my work comes through from people seeing a picture of it, it has to straddle those two things. It has to pop as a photograph and work really well in the real world. And that's a great example of the sort of compromise that you have to make between those two. Okay, um, so now I can tell by the feel that the, the weight is good. I'm gonna have to reduce the weight right here on the outside, um, and there's a spot right in the middle there that needs to be cleaned up. Um, now the trick is, I could clean it up by going just straight across the grain, but you would see that, you would see that right away. No matter what I did, it would be, it would be obvious because it, cuts that go across the grain just react differently, they, they look different than cuts that go with the grain. So what I'm trying to do is come at like a 45 degree angle and clean up that cut. At a certain point, you always wanna just walk away, cut your losses, walk away. Um, but up until that point, you can putz around a little bit, try and get it just the way you want it. Yeah, that's good. So now, put the rim about how I want it on the inside. I've got getting this little bit right here curved instead of straight is another thing that's important to do. I, I think I think it makes a big difference in how a spoon looks. And um, well, you can initially get it by going across the grain like that, it is, it will show up unless you then come back and get it going with the grain. There we go. Okay, spoon bowl done. 
So now the, uh, the last thing I do with the hook knife before I put the hook knife away is I take a tiny little chamfer off the inside edge here. And what that does, just on the very inside edge, and what that does is it, um, you would feel that in your mouth as you pulled it out of your mouth if you didn't do that. You could use your slide knife to do this, but with your slide knife, there's always a danger that if you angle it too much, that your tip would dig in somewhere in the bowl. So by using your hook knife, the tip is always lifted up and out of the way and never you never run that risk of damaging the surface you just created. So carefully. Okay, so now I've done the tiny bevel on the inside that knocks off that little bit. Um, now I'm gonna switch back to the sloyd knife and I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna trim around the outline again and just, I'm not gonna trim everything. I'm just gonna do tiny, just the tiny little spots that are just a little bit bumpy compared to the inside. Now, this is a great example of something where it, you could ruin a perfectly good spoon at this stage. So unless you really feel like you know how to achieve what you want to achieve, I would recommend you stop. Um, and I'm doing, it's, it's even hard to describe just how tiny these cuts are that I'm doing. The other thing I'm doing is I'm doing the same tiny little bevel. I'm almost like not cutting it. I'm just like letting it scrape. Um, not that I'm holding it at a 90 degree angle, but it's, it's just, it's more like a scrape than like a cut. I just want to knock off that sharp little edge. And that's partly how it feels. And it's also a durability thing. When something has a very sharp little edge like that, it's more prone to being damaged and that damage running down into the meat of the wood below it. So by taking off that tiny little bit from the edge, you're making the whole spoon more durable. So there we are there. Now the last thing I'm going to do before I burnish and treat this spoon is um, I can feel just from feeling it that there is a nice taper going from the center out to the rim in all spots except for from here to here is the same thickness from here to here. So I want to, right in here, I want to reduce that. And you can actually almost see it. You see how there's a tiny little bump right there. So the trick is to reduce that without over reducing it and without having to redo the entire back. So this is why I often, if your back is made out of um, big facets, then what you'd want to do is just pull up the facets, each one. If, as in this case, I, I go back and forth, but in this case, my back is made out of a whole bunch of little facets that more are more of a compromise towards a truly rounded face and a faceted face. So I'll just go back and forth with a thumb push, it's just very careful and trying to really, and then feeling it. And trying to make sure I don't create a bump here where I start my cuts. Um, so I'm sort of ghosting into the cuts starting real shallow and then getting deeper, not diving in too deep. If you dive in too deep, then you'll create a bump right where you start your cuts. So you go in shallow and gradually get deeper. All right, so now I'm just making sure that these cuts I'm doing are pulled all the way up to the rim so that I haven't created an additional bump right at the edge of the rim. And Much better curve. So uh, here's the weekend special. It's got a faceted bottom. Um, it's got a nice tail flip. Uh, let's get a couple little spots here. So now I'm going to burnish it. And for burnishing, 
kitchen, I use two things, a ceramic pestle and a, and a deer antler. For a long time, I didn't know where to recommend people get deer antlers, uh, but I just, was at the animal, the pet store, getting some stuff for the puppy, and I found deer antlers. And I had to rummage around quite a bit to find a piece that looked like I could maybe do some burnishing with it, but, and it was, I forget, it was like 10 bucks or something. <laughs> But if you don't have access to deer antlers um, and you want to try one for burnishing, this is probably an economical way to go. Just go and find one that has a curve that looks appropriate. And then what I did for this is I took it through my grits of my sandpaper. So I went, probably started with 400 and just walked my way down. It's not, I didn't get rid of every lump, but what I did was I, I made it so that the ridges were just less pronounced. I was less likely to rub a groove into my spoon and it and made a smooth surface and I went all the way up to 3000 grit with that. So I'll be doing that with this antler at some point just to try and see if that's in fact true. So when I burnish I like to support the bowl in my spoon like this. Mm-hmm. Now, you can burnish for just a little bit. You can burnish for minutes. If you burnish for minutes, it will get smooth, really, really, really smooth. Um, there's a middle ground where you sort of get 80% of the benefit with 20% of the time though, and that's where I tend to leave it. Um, okay, good. And I, I like to use this little bit of the straight bit of the deer antler. So, so this is, I would say, a classic bowl shape for me. It's truly egg-shaped. The rim is fairly level, so there's actual depth to it. Um, the shoulders, it doesn't really have shoulders that are, that stick way up above the work. The crank is there, but not excessive. The rim is pretty small. And there's a little more meat in the center of the bowl than there is um, than there is out at the edges. So So I like this. So, so you know, weekend special experimentation with the faceted underside to this handle, I quite like. I'll probably start doing it on at least some of my eating spoons um, because it's very comfortable without being uh, particularly flashy and, and didn't really take very long to do. Certainly not appreciably longer than what I do now, which is just uh, tend to do just a bottom face and then facet on either side. Um, yeah, I'm glad you're uh, glad you're finding this helpful. So now I'm just gonna treat it with my spoon wax. I just make this myself. You can make it yourself. I also sell tins of it for four dollars for a tin like this. You can do I don't know 10, 15 spoons. Um, but the recipe for it is it's a, just a two to one ratio of yojoba oil or jojoba oil and beeswax. I use white beeswax because I want it to be as neutral colored as possible because I like having the spoon, the color of the spoon wood be the natural color of the wood. Um, jojoba oil is from a drought tolerant plant native to the American Southwest. It was tested at one point by NASA to see if it could replace sperm whale oil in its spaceships. I guess sperm whale oil is very um, stable at high and low temperatures and they thought jojoba oil could be as well. It, I guess it didn't make the cut in terms of being able to replace sperm whale oil, but it, the fact that they were testing it at all gives me confidence. Um, it's technically a liquid wax, and that it's, it's technically a wax, it's not an oil, so it, it never goes rancid, but it's liquid at room temperature. And a two to one ratio of it, I just, I just heat it up in a tin can on the, on the stove burner until the beeswax is melted. I give it a stir, I let it sit, and then I transfer it to tins. Um, so here, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you 
applying it. Hold on, I gotta do this with messy fingers a little bit. So I apply it to the spoon. I keep a little extra on my fingers that I can wipe onto areas that get dry. Uh, I have heard from people who don't have, you know, a gas stove, don't have a flame, that using an oven at a very low temperature also works. The nice thing about doing it over a flame is that areas that suck up more wax, you're sort of doing it in such a short period of time, just a minute, that you can keep smearing on this extra onto areas without them getting dried out. That way you get them to soak up as much as possible. There's also a certain hardening effect that happens. I think it has to do with the, the cell walls collapsing or somehow shrinking, but the wood that has been heated like this gets substantially tougher. I don't know if it makes it more brittle, certainly not in any way that is, uh, that is noticeable, but it, but it is noticeable how much tougher it is. It's a very different feel than it, than it had just a minute ago. Um, I think it's similar to how wood hardens up just from exposure to air. You know, when you have a piece of soft cherry and you leave it out, the outer surface that is exposed to air will get hard in a very similar way. I think whatever's happening with the cells, the wood cells, is um, very similar. So I find that this usually needs extra here on the tip and then back here on the shoulders because that's where the end grain is exposed within the, the piece. And then I usually do the handle, but less so. I concentrate on making sure that the bowl gets as much as it absolutely needs. Because I figure that's the part that is gonna get most use, wear and tear. Um, okay. The nice thing about this beeswax or yoba oil mixture is that it doesn't have any flavor, unlike uh, linseed oil. Um, I switched because I was tired of having customers come back to me and say, you know, I love your spoons, but I really didn't like the, the flavor at first until the linseed oil really cured. And even after linseed oil cured, it, it changes the color of the wood and makes it yellowy, um, especially over time. That yellowing doesn't stop it. It actually gets more so over time. Gotta get a rag. So So now I wipe off any excess. So it's pulled a tremendous amount into the wood itself. This is a matte sort of finish. I mean, it's, it makes it glossy and beautiful, but it's not a hard finish. Um, but what I found with my spoons is that uh, if done with that heat treatment, that it pulls in enough that it really keeps it beautiful. Um, and then as you use your spoon, the patina from using your spoon will build up and slowly replace it. But um, uh, it, it doesn't look any different than a spoon treated with linseed oil after a year of use, except that the spoon treated with linseed oil is yellower. So, um, here it is. Finished eating spoon. Um, and I quite like the faceted back here. So, um, yeah. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Appreciate it.